Welcome once again, my fellow manipulators of digital fate. I'm Richie, this is Capricorn, and this is the set review for Outlaws of Thunder Junction. This video is going to be covering all of the white cards. If you haven't seen the rest of my videos, I'm going to link them in the description below. Make sure to check those out. If you have watched all of the rest of them and you're on to this one, I appreciate you for checking out the channel. It means a lot to me. If you haven't yet, like the video because it helps a ton and subscribe if you find any value here if you're new because I've got tons of content on the way, deck text with all of the new cards, so much stuff coming. So make sure you subscribe if you're new, like if you're not, all the good stuff. We're moving on. First card here is another round. One white, two, and double X for a sorcery. Exile any number of creatures you control and then return them to the battlefield under their owner's control. Then repeat this process X more times. So the floor here is just for three mana. You get to flicker, blink, any number of creatures, have them all re-enter the battlefield and re-trigger their ETBs, which for only three mana is a pretty good floor to be completely honest. And then it starts to scale up. So if you pay a total of five mana, you're gonna get to do that twice. And if you pay a total of seven mana, if you happen to be in the late game and have enough mana to do that, you can actually do it three times in a row, so insane value overload for ETB triggers. This is obviously going to be best with a lot of creatures with ETB abilities, uh, specifically being able to go wide with ETB abilities. That way you have more things to hit with this. Uh, it could just be super powerful. We're going to have to test. Uh, I've got tons of decks, deck ideas. Uh, rolling around in my brain right now specifically for flicker decks um it's an archetype i've been exploring here or there for the past few sets because i already think there are some decent cards in standard that we can uh, do this with um but now in this set we have a ton of support so i would not be surprised if there ends up being a very powerful standard flicker deck after this set drops and we're going to be brewing we're going to be exploring that for sure because it's super fun and i think the potential for it to be in incredibly powerful is there for sure next up we have archangel of tithes this is a reprint this is the first time it's been printed other than the first set it was printed in at least as far as in actual standard legal sets which is pretty cool this is a three five flying angel for three white and one as long as Archangel of Tithes is untapped. Creatures can't attack you or Planeswalkers you control unless their controller pays one for each of those creatures. And then as long as Archangel of Tithes is attacking, creatures can't block unless their controller pays one for each of those creatures. So, does some really interesting stuff. And on the surface, it doesn't seem like a lot. It doesn't seem like it's very much mana. It seems like it's pretty easy for your opponent to play around this. But really, when you start to get into the weeds of how this deck will work and how things will line up and sequence out, it gets really interesting because if they're having to pay mana to attack you, they're not able to use that mana to play more board presence onto the board. But Archangel of Tithes doesn't tax you in any way. So you're not slowed down from committing board presence to the board, which means the longer Archangel stays out, if your opponent is still trying to swing in at you every turn, uh, the more and more you'll start to take over the board, just shoot, just through sheer uh, value, just just through your um, your tempo gains from them having to hold up mana to swing at you with. Not only that, but if they don't leave any mana untapped, if they tap out for the turn, whether it's to attack or to play things or both, then. You can essentially just swing in with your whole team unblockable. If they're tapped out, they have no mana to pay, to, to pay, they can't pay one for any of your creatures. So all of your creatures become unblockable. So now they have to hold up mana to make sure your creatures aren't unblockable. And then they have to hold up mana if they want to attack you. So there's no way they can keep up with your board presence. They're going to slowly fall behind, not be able to play as many things each turn as you. Even if they decide to not swing at you anymore, well, now they're not closing the game as quick as they could, right? And you've got even more time to accrue any any kind of board control and really just take over the game. So there's so many different ways in which this just really messes with your opponent's tempo and forces them to be in a position where they just can't keep up with you no matter where they put their mana. And that's kind of awesome. So I can't wait to mess around with this card in standard. I definitely think... Uh, 
I already have an angel deck that I think is pretty awesome and this is gonna slot in really well and in fact it might even it might even be a completely new angel brew with all the new cards that we have because there might be that much new potential it's gonna be interesting to explore I really like this card a lot um, very high very high, uh, almost, like, like in the top five cards, almost a top card of, of the color for me, but not quite there. Next up, we have Armored Armadillo. One white for a 0-4 Armadillo with Ward 1, and you can pay four mana to give it plus X plus O until end of turn, where X is its toughness. I actually think this is kind of insane as a common. It comes down and just blocks aggro forever for only one mana, right? You can't lightning strike it, you can't lightning helix it. Like, sure, you could cut it down, but then you're wasting a cut down on a 0-4 and you have to pay an extra mana because of the ward one. Like, it just sits there and blocks all day. And then eventually when you have enough mana to just dump into this, like it's a mana sink, it becomes a relevant attacker. It can just swing as a 4-4 or even block as a 4-4 if you wanna kill something. Uh, being able to just hold up mana to threaten the ability to turn this into a 4-4 might keep your your opponent from swinging in at you. And then after they decide not to swing because they're worried about you using the ability, you can use that mana to like flash in a flash creature or play an instant speed thing. So some really cool things you can do with this. Uh, it doesn't look like much on the surface, but I actually think it's really good once you get down to it. So, uh, especially considering there is some sort of a flash speed archetype within Limited in this set. So if you're in that, this is going to be a really good inclusion for something like that. Next up, we have Avon Interrupter. This is actually my pick for the best card in white. And there's a couple of really good reasons for that. Uh, Avon Interrupter, 2 white and 1 for a 2-2 two -two bird rogue with flash and flying. So it's already a 2-2 flyer that comes down at instant speed, which is pretty good for 3 mana. Not amazing, but pretty good. When it enters the battlefield, you exile target spell. That spell becomes plotted, which means its owner can cast it as a sorcery, but only on a later turn, but without paying its mana cost. And then spells your opponent's, opponent's cast from graveyards or from exile cost 2 more to cast. This thing just does so much. So the floor here is at the very least. You try to cast a spell, I'm going to play this, exile that spell. You can't immediately replay it. Even though it's going to be free when you replay it, you can't do it immediately. Because when something's plotted, the, the definition of being plotted is you have to play it on a later turn. So it becomes plotted. At the very least, they have to wait an entire turn cycle before they can play it again. And when they do play it, it has to be at sorcery speed. And because of the second static ability there, it's going to cost two mana. It's not going to be exactly free. It's still going to cost two mana. So worst case scenario, this gives you some nice flash flying tempo that delays their best important spell that you need to hit by a whole turn cycle and still make sure it costs a little bit when they play it. But then you add into that the fact that anything they cast from exile or from their graveyard is going to cost two more. Anything that's an adventure, anything that's been exiled from the top of their library so that they can play it until end of turn. All of that stuff's going to cost two more. Any kind of flashback, because that's playing it from the graveyard, all of that stuff's going to cost two more. So you're taxing all of that stuff, and sometimes that's just going to be okay. It's going to be marginal. Maybe there's a card or two in your opponent's deck that that will work against. But other times against really good decks that are have these in abundance, you can really sh kind of shut down their whole deck, right? If you're up against a very adventure deck with tons of adventure creatures, uh, you can just make all of them cost two more from Exile, and it slows them down incredibly. But then there's another mode on this, where if you use this to Exile any spell that needs to be cast at instant speed, because the plotted card can only be played as a sorcery, that spell is effectively gone forever. And the most notable thing that I can bring up, the best example, is Counterspell itself. If they try to Counterspell something, you can use Avon Interrupter as a hard Counterspell to that counter. A Counterspell that exiles their Counterspell, because when it enters the battlefield, it'll exile that Counterspell, it becomes plotted, but it can never be cast. 
because it can only be played at sorcery speed and there's never going to be something on the stack to counter at sorcery speed. So this effectively completely shuts down all counter spells. It's a counter to a counter. And if there's anything else that needs to be played at instant speed to be really good, maybe certain combat tricks, stuff like that, you could shut those down pretty well as well. So there's that. But that's not it. Then there's another mode <laughs> that on this that's pretty crazy as well. And that's anything that's a really bummy, expensive play that can be cast for much cheaper. And my best example for this is uh, Virtue of Persistence, right? You can play your own Virtue of Persistence. You can play the uh, Adventure side for two mana. And then you can respond by playing Avon Interrupter and exile your own spell and make it plotted. And yes, that means it doesn't resolve. But now that the spell is plotted, the spell as a whole is plotted. And on your next turn, you can choose which side of it to play for zero mana, for free. Which means the big side, the seven mana enchantment that gets a creature back from a graveyard every turn, can now enter the battlefield for free. Which is crazy. And there's a number of cards that you're going to be able to do, do that with and get that kind of a benefit. So... There's just so many little nuanced ways in which this can be absolutely busted. But then on top of that, if you just use it fairly, just use it the way it's intended, it's still really good. So when you take both of those into account, I think this card is just absolutely insane. I have a number of different brews that I'm going to be using it in, and it is my pick for the best white card in the set. The card is just nuts. Next up, we have Bounding Felidar, 1 white and 5 for a 4-7 cat beast mount. Whew, that's a lot. Whenever Bounding Felidar attacks while saddled, you get to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each other creature you control and gain a life for each of those creatures. That's kind of insane. And then it saddles for 2, which means you can tap any number of other creatures you control with a total power equaling 2 or more uh, to make it become saddled only at sorcery speed, so you can only do it on attacks, but all the saddle triggers are on attack anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, this is great. It's expensive. It is very, very expensive. That's, that's the biggest problem. Um, but it's so powerful. If this comes down, if you can actually survive until you can put this down, and if it can just stick around for a couple turns, your whole team is going to get huge. And because this has a 7 toughness, it is really hard for your opponent to block and kill this in combat without losing something substantial in the process. So, I just think this card is really good. Uh, it is very expensive, so I don't think by any means you can put more than just one in your deck. But if you're in any kind of go-wide deck or any kind of ramp deck that makes it easier to cast this earlier, or maybe both somehow, uh, this will be a pretty good inclusion. You'll pick this up middle of the pack and jam it for sure. Just one though. It's too expensive to go more than one, I think. Next up, we have Bovine Intervention. One white and one for an instant. Destroy target artifact or creature. Its controller creates a 2-2 white ox creature token. Now, the saving grace of this card is the fact that it's an instant. So you can use it as a combat trick in the middle of combat. It kind of sucks that they're getting a 2-2 uh, in replace of, you know, what in replacement of whatever you're killing. Um, but... Nine times out of ten, you're going to kill something that's way, way better than a 2-2, so it's not awful. It's nice that you can grab this at lower than rare rarity as decent removal in your limited deck for literally any any creature, no matter how balmy it is, right? That's nice, but giving them a 2-2 is kind of rough. And like I said, the silver lining here is use it in the middle of combat. If they swing in with it, not only are you killing their creature, you're also preventing two damage or, uh, you know, if, if you swing in and then they declare blockers, you kill the thing that's going to kill your guy, and they get a 2-2 that's not blocking that turn and can't contribute to combat, so you can get a little bit of extra value. So there's ways to make it better, but I think it's, I think it's kind of middle-of-the-road removal. Um, another thing to note, another way you could use this, is you could destroy your own artifact token, like a map token or something like that, or just your own 1-1 one, one creature, uh, and either of those, and then get your own 2-2. Two, two. So in a way, this could be a panic button like, oh crap, I need a 2-2 two, two at instant speed. I'll do this, make a 2-2 two, two, block, or whatever the case may be. So 
Nice little bit of upside there that you can have that mode if you're in a pinch, but I don't think that's going to happen most of the time, so it shouldn't be your reason for running the card. Next up, we have Bridled Bighorn. This was actually close to being uh, one of my limited picks, my top limited pick for, this, for the, the white cards in this set, because it's a really good card. It's not quite there, uh, but it's a really good card. 3-4 Sheep Mount with Vigilance for 1 white and 3, so pretty decently on rate as it is. But then whenever it attacks while it's saddled, you make a 1-1 one, one white sheep creature token. And it saddles for 2. So, right out of the gates, right, whatever you're playing the turn after you play this can immediately saddle the bighorn. Because it can't swing itself anyway, right? Unless it has haste. So, you saddle it up, you swing in, you make a sheep token. After you've attacked with this guy twice while saddled, you're going to have 2 sheep tokens. At that point, the sheep tokens themselves can saddle the bighorn so that it's self-sufficient and it can keep making sheep tokens every single turn without you having to tap down your other creatures. So being able to get that kind of value long term over the course of the game out of just a common is actually really good. I think this is probably going to be one of the higher picks for commons, so keep your eye on it. Next up we have Claim Jumper. I kind of love this card. 1 white and 2 for a 3-3 three, three Vigilance Rabbit Mercenary, so it does count as an Outlaw. It also counts as a Rabbit, which is probably going to be important when the next set, Bloomborough, is released. Because Rabbit Tribal is absolutely going to be a thing, so keep that in mind. When Claim Jumper enters the battlefield, if an opponent controls more lands than you, you may search your library for a Plains card and put it onto the battlefield tapped. Then if, if an opponent controls more lands than you still, you repeat this process again. Um... So this can get up to two lands onto the battlefield tapped while still being an on-rate 3-3 three, three Vigilance body for three. And all of that is just awesome. Uh, this is going to be especially good against any kind of a ramp deck because they are going to be ramping up their land. And this just lets you keep pace with their ramp without losing tempo, without losing the opportunity to put pressure on the opponent by putting bodies on the board that can swing in, right? So being able to keep up with the ramp deck's ramp without losing any of your aggression is super awesome. So at the very least, this might be a really good sideboard card, um, but I have a feeling there are gonna be some, some standard brews around it for sure. Another thing worth pointing out is you can grab any planes card. It doesn't have to be a basic. So this is a good way of fetching your triomes or your dual lands that count as planes uh, and being able to get those onto the battlefield for free. So pretty awesome card here. Next up we have collector's cage this is actually my pick for sleeper in the set and don't get me wrong there are plenty of people who are liking this card and thinking it's good uh but i don't think most people realize just how good it is yet this is one white and one for an artifact has hideaway five so you get to reveal the top five cards of your library when it enters the battlefield exile one put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order and then at that point, you can pay one mana and tap it to put a plus one, plus one counter on anything. And then if you control three or more creatures with different powers, you may play the exiled card without paying its mana cost. So the reason this is so good is not only is it one of the cheapest hideaways we've gotten in a while at only two mana, it's also very easy to turn on because all you got to do is play it in any normal deck that's going to run a bunch of creatures that you go wide with, and then all you gotta do is just make sure you add your counter to the thing that's gonna give you that third separate power. And then you're good. You get to play the thing for free. So, super cheap. Uh, being able to turn it on is super easy. It's not like fight rigging where you have to play very specific creatures in order to get, get them buffed to the size you need them right away so that you can play the thing right away. This just comes down on a wide board and can almost always do it, if not immediately, definitely by the next turn. So, very easy to activate, very, very cheap, but the most important part of this card is the fact that it's an artifact. This is the only hideaway, at least the only hideaway in standard, that is an artifact and not an enchantment. And that's super important because almost all of the things in standard that flicker, that blink permanence, cannot hit enchantments, but they can hit artifacts. That was a very specific change they made after uh, sagas became a thing because they realized that blinking sagas was just crazy and out of control and too much value. Um, so they sort of started to 
shift the direction of blank spells to only be able to target artifacts and creatures, except for in very, very rare situations where the blank spells are kind of overcosted. There are one or two that can hit enchantments, but they're not great on rate. They're not aggressively costed, right? Um, so being able to blink this thing is nuts. You combine that with the fact that it's pretty easy to trigger, it means you're playing something for free pretty soon after you drop this, and then once you play it, you can just blink this, re-trigger the hideaway, exile something new, and then do it all over again. And you could just keep doing this if you want. So, I just think this card is insane. <laughs> you do have to put it in the right deck where you have enough creatures where you're going wide early so that it's not going to be too tough to just trigger this pretty quickly after you play it. But in that deck, especially if you have blink support, I just think this card is just nuts. So, my pick for Sleeper, card is bonkers, that's all there is to it. Next up we have Dust Animus, this is one white and one for a 2-3 spirit with flying. If you control five or more untapped lands, Dust Animus enters the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters and a lifelink counter on it, and you can plot it for one white and one. So the idea here is if you plot this, you're going to get to play it for free from exile, so on whatever turn after that, you can play it before you use your mana for anything else, so that when it does enter the battlefield, all of your lands are going to be untapped. So you just need to get to five lands, and then you can play this before you spend your mana, and have it enter as a 4-5 flyer, which is pretty awesome. They are, there are some, you know, those, those are hoops that you have to jump through, they're not the easiest in the world. Um, but just the ability for this to be a 4-5 flyer early in the game, if you can jump through those hoops, is really good. But I think what makes this card especially good is probably the most overlooked part of it, and that is even without trying to, like, get it into play early or cheat around its constraints or whatever, just a 2-3 flyer for 2 that can be bigger later in the game is pretty good, right? If you have it early, you get a 2-3 flyer for 2, and that's fine. But then if you top deck this later where you have like 7 mana, you don't even need to plot it. You just play it, you still have 5 untapped lands, and it comes in as a 4-5 flyer. So it's a way for your pretty decent on-curve flyer that you want to play on turn 2 to not just be a 2-3 flyer if you get it later. If you, if you end up top decking it later, it's a little bit more valuable. It's a little bit of a more of a closer for you. So... Just that versatility, I think, makes it pretty good, and you add in the fact that you can plot it, and you can, you know, work around, build around ways of getting that bigger body much sooner in the right decks, and I just think this card can do a lot of work in ways that uh, people are going to underestimate, so pretty cool card. It's not, like, absolutely incredible, um, but I think it's a lot more solid than most people give it credit for. Next up, we have Ariette's Lullaby, one white and one for a sorcery. Destroys a tapped creature, gives you two life. That seems great for a common, right? This is better than some uh, uncommon removal, to be completely honest. Uh, granted, the creature has to be tapped, but you only have to pay two mana, and it's any tapped creature. So it doesn't matter how big it is, like, you're still going to kill it. And then you just gain a little bit of life, too, to make up for maybe aggro trying to race down your clock and that that kind of thing all of that just seems great so i think this is a relatively high pick one of the higher picks for a common for sure uh and definitely an easy include in limited next up we've got final showdown and this is actually my second uh the second best card in white for me this is my runner-up in white this card is just bananas uh, one white mana for an instant, it does have Spree, so for an extra one mana, all creatures lose all abilities until end of turn. It's fine. Situationally, that could be really important. Most of the time, it won't, but as an extra mode, it's fine. Plus one mana, choose a creature you control, it gains indestructible until end of turn. So, for just two mana, if you ignore all the other modes, you can just use this as a way to save your dude as a combat trick in combat, or in response to a removal spell or whatever, but then the meat and potatoes here is for an extra two white and three, destroy all creatures. So, six mana, instant speed, wrath of god. Full stop. Yes, six mana is a lot. It's more than the five mana you have to pay for Sunfall. I get that, but instant speed is insane. 
you can wait until their turn so that they commit even more creatures to the board and you get to make sure they're all dead too. You can do it at the end of their turn so that you get to play out all of your new board state stuff before they do instead of having to use the mana on your turn on your turn for a sorcery speed sweeper and then they're the first player that gets to start rebuilding. You could just do this in the middle of combat, right? You can declare blocks and then your opponent tries to cast some tricks to blow you out and you go, screw it. <laughs> Instant speed, I'm just gonna wreck everything. Your tricks are wasted. Congratulations, you gave me more card advantage. I was gonna I was gonna nuke everything at end of turn anyway. So you can do all of that. But then on top of that, if you have an extra mana, now that first ability, that situational ability, is starting to look a little bit better. Because if you're up against a deck with a lot of death triggers, and they're gonna get a bunch of triggers when all their stuff dies, if you cast this as a wrath, well now you can turn all that off for an extra mana. You can make it so all creatures lose all abilities until end of turn. So none, no death triggers, <laughs> none of that. Situationally, you can make sure they don't get those if you need to. And then if you have enough mana to just pay for everything, you can give your best creature indestructible so that it doesn't die in the wrath. Not only is this an instant speed wrath, it's an instant speed wrath that for an extra mana is going to leave behind your best guy and leave behind nothing for them. Like, the versatility and reach of this card is insane. Yes, it's expensive. It's not going to take the place of Sunfall because of that. But it's a whole new, whole different kind of broken. And, uh... It's absolutely going to see a lot of play. It's going to get really annoying. Welcome to control decks. Good god. Next up we have Fortune, Loyal Steed. One white and two for a 2-4 legendary beast mount. When he enters the battlefield you scry two. And whenever he attacks while saddled, at end of combat you get to exile it and up to one creature that saddled it this turn. And return those cards to the battlefield under their owner's control. And it saddles for just one. So... This just does a lot. You play this in a Blink deck, obviously, right? Blink and Flicker is getting so much support, we've already talked about that. This is just an engine for Blinking and Flickering. It's almost like a mini Yorian that you can just use every single turn. But it can only flicker one thing, right? It, it does have to flicker a creature too, so keep that in mind. But you just saddle this with whatever creature has a good ETB that you want to get. You swing in, not only do you get to swing in for two, but when you flicker the other creature with the ETB, you're also flickering Fortune himself. They're both coming back into play. You're getting your ETB, you're getting his ETB and scrying two again, and then you're also having him untapped so that he can be a blocker. It's almost like he swung with Vigilance. It's almost like he attacks as a 2-4 Vigilance when he attacks scry two, and flicker your dude and if you think about it that way it's kind of crazy uh he just does so much he's just so good he can't be cut down he can't be lightning struck or lightning helix just there's so many little tiny silver lining things that make this card so incredibly good i can't wait to brew a blank deck with this guy the potential is there and it's so real so it's gonna be super fun i can't wait Next up we have Frontier Seeker, 1 white and 1 for a 2-1 human scout. This was actually almost my limited pick for best limited card, um, but there is one card that I think is just a little bit more valuable that we'll get to later. Uh, but 2 mana for a 2-1 human scout, when it enters the battlefield, look at the top 5 cards of your library. You may reveal a mount card or planes card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So even if you just fetch a planes, Getting a 2 power creature for your 2 mana that also gives you that card advantage, fetches you a planes, makes sure you don't stop hitting your land drops, and thins out your deck a little bit so that you can draw into more gas. Like, all of that's kind of insane on an uncommon. Like, this could be a 1-1, one, one, and it would still probably see play. As a 2 power creature for 2 that can pretty much trade with any other 2 drop of your opponents, this card is nice. <laughs> this card is really good. But then it's got extra value in that if you're playing Mount Tribal, like you can find a mount really easily and then it's just crazy, crazy value, right? Even if you're not deep into like Mount Tribal, 
if you just happen to have a mount creature in your deck and there's an offhand chance that sometimes you can grab the mount instead, that's some extra upside that's really good too. And also, keep in mind that the planes doesn't have to be basic. So you, again, you can fetch triomes, you can fetch dual lands, uh, you can find whatever you need to fix your mana if you have the right if you have the right lands in your deck. So I think this is kind of nutty. And also, it's another one of those cards that can be ETB'd. It works with fortune. Like, you could keep flickering this every turn to find more fortunes or more lands. Like, that seems pretty crazy. So, I think this card is really, really good. Very high pick. Uh, this, is, this is one of the higher picks in white for common or uncommon. So, definitely snatch it up before it goes away. Next up, we have Getaway Glamour. Glamour? Glamour. I think it's Glamour. One white for an instant with Spree, one extra mana, you exile target non-token creature, and then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step, so it can just be a two mana instant speed flicker spell, which is awesome. For an extra two mana, destroy target creature if no other creature has greater power. So this is a two mana flicker spell, or a three mana removal spell of, of the biggest creature on the board, or... Four mana do both. All of that is amazing. The versatility and the sheer card advantage, if you have all four mana, is just kind of bananas. Obviously, you want to use this in a flicker deck. There is an archetype within Limited uh, that wants you to lean into flickering stuff, so you absolutely pick this super high in that. But even outside of that, I think this is a high pick just because of the, the creature removal at instant speed. You can do some pretty crazy stuff with it. I think this is a home run. So... Pick this pretty high, maybe not as high as that last guy we saw, but pretty high uh, in limited. And I'm absolutely going to use this in, in any flicker deck that I make in standard, most likely. I'm at least going to try it, but uh, I don't see how this couldn't make the cut. It's, it's just that good. Next up, we have Grand Abolisher. Two white mana for a 2-2 human cleric. During your turn, your opponents can't cast spells or activate abilities of artifacts, creatures, or enchantments. This guy is insane. Uh, this is a reprint, so we already know that this guy is insane. But he's especially good in this set because we have mounts. And mounts require you to tap other creatures to turn on their abilities. So if your opponent tries to, you know, hold up any tricks and, you know, butt their, butt their nose into your business... You saddle your guy and try to swing in and then they kill your mount and you don't get the trigger but you wasted your guy tapping him for nothing to saddle something that just ended up eating a removal spell. Feels real bad. If you have Grand Abolisher on the battlefield, opponent can't do that. They can't mess with your stuff on your turn. You can saddle your dudes without worry of losing tempo and tapping your dude for nothing. But it this card does way more than that, right? Just shutting down counter spells completely with how good the counter spells have been getting up until this point is pretty surreal. Shutting down flash decks, any instant speed interaction at all, even regardless of mounts, like this guy's just nutty. I expect him to be a huge staple in sideboards for sure. And I'm kind of thinking there might be some sort of a new prison deck in standard that could use this guy as well as part of the main deck. What deck could that be? Well, maybe a deck using our next card, High Noon. And this is actually my pick for my favorite white card of the set, which is surprising because I'm not usually an instant speed control player. Uh, sometimes I'm a control player, but when I am, it's usually tap out control. I think it's more fun to let your opponents do their thing and then just completely take away all of their fun that they did <laughs> after the fact um but counter spells counter spells can be fun in the right circumstance too and if that circumstance is high noon i'm all for it two mana for an enchantment each player can't cast more than one spell each turn full stop also you can pay one red and four and sack it to deal five damage to any target because why not <laughs> this card is bananas so, if they can't cast more than one spell each turn, and you've just got a counter spell ready for that spell, what are they going to do? They're never going to resolve anything ever again. And granted, that means you can't cast a spell either. You have to keep countering their thing, right? 
But then you could play the card we were just talking about, right? <laughs> the Grand Abolisher. So, if they can only play cards on their turn, and only one card a turn, but you can play cards on both turns, then on your turn, you can play your board presence, your, your thing that's going to win you the game, and they can't really do anything about it. They can't play anything. And then on their turn, you can just counter their one spell. And you can just do that every turn. So you could probably win. Even if you don't hard lock them like that, being able to kind of soft lock them with this card on the board uh, and get value over time is awesome. And then the fact that you can use it as removal is just kind of wild. Oh, they got their shieldred out. If you're desperate, just sack it, kill the shieldred, right? Five damage is enough to kill Shelly, and that's important. But what's easily overlooked about this card that's even better is you can do that five damage to any target. So you can target their head. You can just put this out, soft lock them down, just make them feel all sorts of bad, and then if you get them to five damage, just sack the thing and kill them. So it's almost like it reduces their starting life total to 15, as well as making it so that they can't cast more than one spell each turn. And that just seems kind of crazy to me. <laughs> so... I don't know. I just kind of love this card. Uh, my brain, the, the, the gears are grinding to try to find ways to abuse this and play this. Uh, I really want to play this in like a flash tribal deck because if I can flash something in on your turn and play something on my turn, but you can only ever play something on your turn, uh, I'm gonna I'm just going to pull ahead over time, right? So I don't even know if we need to like completely break this card. I think just that alone could be enough to make this card pretty pretty gnarly. So, it's a really good card. It's a really good card. Next up, we've got Holy Cow. It's a really holy, holy card. Nectar of the Gods. Sorry I didn't warn you ahead of time, but coffee's important. Sweet Nectar. Now, where were we? Holy Cow. One white and two for a 2-2 Ox Angel with Flash and Flying. When he enters the battlefield, you gain two life and scry one. Now, cards like this have drawn a card when they enter the battlefield in the past, but they didn't have all of the upside that Holy Cow has. So, being able to scry one is at least as close as you can get to drawing a card, and effectively will work in a similar fashion in Limited, where you're going to be able to dig one card deeper, get one turn closer to your bomb which is really important, or sometimes to that land that you need to make that next land drop with. So that can be really import, uh, important and really effective. But also just the flash flying body sometimes can come down when your opponent least expects it. Maybe it can block really well, kill one of their three twos. And gaining a little bit of life helps mitigate some of the damage coming across from aggro. So all in all, it's a nice little card here, a nice full package of value. And I think you're going to want to draft it relatively high, at least for a common. You're probably going to want to jam one of these in your deck. That being said, it's not like a first pick. It's not a super high pick or anything like that. It's probably going to table, so uh, pick one up when it comes by. Next up, we've got Inventive Wingsmith. This is one white and two for a 2-4 Dwarf Artificer. The beginning of your end step, if you haven't cast a spell from your hand this turn, and Inventive Wingsmith doesn't have a flying counter on it, you put a flying counter on it. So, pretty cool card here. 2-4 body for 3 mana is not nothing in limited. And the fact that this gets a flying counter and not flying until end of turn when you don't play a, a spell from your hand is really, really important. Because then it has flying for the rest of the game, right? So a 2-4 flyer for 3 mana is awesome. Now, worst case scenario, you can just wait until you're out of gas and can't play anything. And if you happen to be in that situation, it'll just get the counter. But there's other ways that you can force uh, force this to get the flying counter a little bit more effectively without wasting a turn. You can go really deep into plot, make sure you have things to cast with plot so that if you're exiling something from your hand with plot, you're not actually casting something so you'll get the flying counter. Uh, same as if you're actually playing an, an already plotted spell from exile, you're not playing it from your hand so you can still get the counter. And then also there is a sort of, you know, flash archetype within limited in this set. So if you just hold up your stuff and play it at instant speed on your opponent's turn, you can get that flying counter at the end of your turn because you didn't play anything on your turn. So a lot of cool ways to use this. And I think if you're in any of those archetypes where you can much easier 
much more easily get this flying counter and utilize it instead of having to wait until you're out of gas. I think this goes up in value and you're probably going to want to grab it a little earlier. Um, but even outside of that, I think this is a pretty solid like second half of the pack pick uh, if you're in white. Next up we have Lassoed by the Law. One white and three for an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls until Lassoed by the Law leaves the battlefield. So, four mana, removal, Oblivion Ring style, get any non-land permanent under the enchantment, right? But when Lassoed by the Law enters the battlefield, you also create a 1-1 red mercenary creature token that can tap to give any creature plus one plus O until end of turn at sorcery speed. So, this is actually really good and limited. I think for constructed, it's going to be too expensive. It's not, it's not going to make the cut. But for limited, you're looking to get as much value out of your stuff as you can. So being able to literally get rid of any threat with this, but also give yourself board presence. And it's not just a 1-1. It's a 1-1 that has this ability that can make one of your other creatures bigger. Maybe it's a lifelinking creature. Maybe it's a double striking creature. Maybe it's just a flying creature that can actually get in in the air because they don't have a flyer. There's so many situations where that extra plus one attack can mean way more than just the 1-1 body. Uh, so being able to get that extra value on a thing that's already really good removal that's going to hit any bomb that you need it to hit is super good so i think this is a very high pick in white i would make sure to grab it because it ain't it ain't gonna table next up we have mystical tether one white and two for an enchantment you can cast it as if it had flash if you pay two more so for five mana it's an instant speed enchantment when it enters the battlefield, you exile an artifact or creature and opponent controls until Mystical Tether leaves the battlefield. Now, this is the less good version of the last card we saw, essentially. <laughs> but this is still worth it. Honestly, 3 mana to hit any artifact or creature is already pretty decent removal. But the fact that if you get this later in the game and you have the extra mana, you can also use it as a combat trick and somewhat maybe blow out your opponent, set up a situation where you can do more damage to them in the metaphorical sense uh, than uh, you otherwise would if you just cast this at sorcery speed like normal. So some really cool stuff here. Uh, it's just it's just going to be a solid removal spell. You're going to absolutely want to grab, you know, at least one of these to shore up your removal suite if you're a little ro low on removal. Um, especially if you're in the flash deck where you want to not play stuff on your turn so that you can get some some value. This, there is this other way of playing this card so that you can play it on your opponent's turn with, with Flash. Um, that way you don't have to play a spell on your turn and you can get that extra value. So keep that in mind. It's probably going to go up in value a little bit if you're kind of in that archetype. Next up we have Nurturing Pixie. This is just one white mana for a 1-1 one, one Flying Fairy Rogue. But when it enters the battlefield you get to return up to one target non-fairy, non-land permanent you control to its owner's hand. And if you do, you put a plus one plus one counter on Nurturing Pixie. Honestly, just a 1-1 one, one flyer for one that also counts as an outlaw and gets those kinds of tribal synergies is pretty good to start. But the fact that this can get even better, especially if you're in like the Flicker deck, the ETB archetype uh, in Limited, where you can use this a little later in the game to return something that you want to recast to get that enters the battlefield trigger. And then not only that, but you have a 2-2 flyer now instead of a 1-1 flyer, and it still only costs 1 mana. That's the important thing to note. You don't have to pay any extra mana for it to come in as a bigger creature. So you're still getting a 2-2 flyer for just 1 mana, and you're getting your ETB creature back in your hand. That can be really powerful in the right deck. So I think even in Outlaw Tribal, this is pretty decent, and you're probably going to want to grab it, you know, middle of the pack um, if you're in Outlaw Tribal that has white. But if you're in the deck that has, you know, a lot of ETB stuff and you're trying to flicker and you're going that archetype, this goes way up in value and I think you're going to want to grab one relatively high. Next up we have Oltec Matter Weaver. This was almost my sleeper pick uh, because I think it's better than most people realize. This is a 2-4 human artificer for 1 white and 2. Whenever you cast a creature spell you get to choose one. You either make a 1-1 one, one colorless gnome artifact creature token, which is fine. Or you make a token that's a copy of any artifact token you control. So, first of all, even if you don't have any crazy big artifact tokens, just the versatility here of literally every single creature you play 
triggers this and makes either a 1-1 token or a copy of a treasure token or a blood token or a map token or a clue token or any of these little insignificant tokens, just getting to make any one of those, whichever one's going to best serve you in the moment, every single time you cast a creature, and that's the important thing to know, it's literally every creature you cast. It doesn't matter how you cast it or why you cast it. It doesn't matter if it's only once a turn, none of that crap. Like, just every single creature you spell is going to trigger this. And even if you don't have a token to copy, you at least get a 1-1. One, one. So, that seems kind of good in and of itself on a body that you can't lightning strike and you can't cut down. But then you start taking into account the fact that you have things like Thousand Moon Smithy that can make huge artifact tokens. And there's a couple other cards in this set that can do similar things and make you really big artifact tokens. Not to mention there's a few cards in standard that allow you to make copies of things that end up being tokens that count as artifacts. And this could be perfect with that. So there's a lot of ways to potentially abuse this, but even if you're not abusing it, it's just a ton of value just jamming it down and then just playing a bunch of creatures. So the floor is relatively high. The ceiling is astronomically high. It's just a really good card. Next up, we have Omen Port Vigilante, one white and one for a 2-2 human mercenary. It has double strike as long as you've committed a crime this turn. I almost picked this as my favorite limited card um, because I think it's really easy. I've said this a million times, but I think it's really easy to just commit crimes doing the things you normally want to be doing, like using your removal spells. And so it's really easy to turn on this ability without having to like jump through a whole bunch of hoops, right? And being able to consistently swing in as as a double striker that can deal four damage to the opponent if it goes unblocked or just deal first strike damage if it does get blocked, it could just be super valuable. And it's like I said, it's just so easy to just, oh, it's my turn. I kill your creature. I swing with my 2-2 double striker. That just seems bananas. So I think this is a relatively high pick for limited, particularly if you're in the outlaw tribal sort of thing because it does count as an outlaw, and if this gets any kind of outlaw synergies whatsoever alongside being able to consistently get that double strike, it could just be insane and, and maybe take over the game. I don't even want to start talking about ramping uh, into buff spells with this, like, good god. Next up we have One Last Job. This card is awesome, I considered this as a sleeper as well. One white and two for a sorcery, it has spree. For an extra 2 mana, you return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. For an extra 1 mana, you return target mount or vehicle card from your graveyard to the battlefield. And for an extra 1 mana, you get to return an aura or equipment card from your graveyard to the battlefield. The main stipulation being, it's attached to a creature you control if you do that. So, here's the thing. The floor of this card is like, it's just a 5 mana, return any creature from your graveyard to the battlefield which honestly is the going rate for those kinds of spells. Five mana, nine times out of ten is what you have to pay to get something from the graveyard onto the battlefield. The main difference here being the fact that it's white instead of black, which is huge. You could play a reanimator deck probably for the first time in standard. I think there's enough support now with this card as well. You can actually probably play a, a reanimator deck that doesn't have any black in it whatsoever, which is kind of crazy. Um, but it's also a card advantage kind of card where you can actually use all of the modes and get three things back if you have the mana. So just being able to use a normal reanimator spell that gets a big bomb out of the graveyard way earlier than you should, that could also be way more than that if you have it a little bit later in the game with some leftover mana, that alone seems pretty gnarly. But then you start to take into account the types of things you can bring back, like one of the mounts you could return would be um, uh, the big the big six mana red calamity uh, mount, which is huge and it saddles for one. And then when it attacks, it makes two copies of whatever saddled it. Like bring that back and another bomb, and then saddle it with the bomb. And when it swings, it makes two more copies of that other bomb creature. That seems insane. You can do all of that for six mana. Or, if you play Jace, you can plot this, and you don't have to pay the base cost of 3, and then for just 2 mana, you can reanimate something. Or for just 3 mana, you can reanimate anything, and that mount we were talking about, 
all of that just seems crazy and I haven't even gotten into the auras and equipment you could possibly use to go way over the top like that could be insane. It's also worth noting that the aura or equipment is automatically attached to a creature. You don't have to pay any equip costs or anything like that. You could just completely blow out your opponent and win in one fell swoop if you have the right things in your graveyard. I'm not 100% sure what the best auras or equipments would be to use with this card. I haven't dug that deep into it yet, but I absolutely want to brew something that's utilizing this. So if you have any ideas about a really good aura or equipment that we could use with this card, with some of the synergies that I've already been talking about, let me know in the comments, please, because uh, it'd be cool to, to point out some very specific ores or equipments that would be awesome in that kind of a deck. Next up, we have Outlaw Medic. This is one white and one for a 1-3 human rogue with lifelink. When he dies, you draw a card. This card's awesome. For a common? Heck yeah. It blocks aggro all day. They don't even want to swing into you because you're just going to gain some life back, right? And if they do happen to get rid of it, you just get to draw a card to replace it. Everything about this card is awesome. This is absolutely going to see play in Limited. You don't even have to pick it high. Um, you're going to get it in the last half of the pack, right? Grab one or two, run them in your deck. They're going to be great, especially in Outlaw Tribal. Next up, we have Prairie Dog, a 2-2 squirrel with lifelink for one white and one. That's already really good. <laughs> lifelink is super good and limited way better than anyone gives it credit for and you have to keep that in mind when you're evaluating these cards for draft so keep that in mind 2-2 two, two, lifelink for two mucho bueno at the beginning of your end step if you haven't cast a spell from your hand this turn you put a plus one plus one counter on prairie dog it's so easy to trigger that if you're in the right archetype if you're plotting anything if you're casting anything that you previously plotted, or if you're just holding your mana up for flash and instant speed stuff, all of that's going to allow this to become a 3-3. Even if this only triggers one time, it's a 3-3 lifelinker that costs you two mana for the rest of the game, right? But if you can manage to trigger this multiple times over multiple turns, it just gets insane. Not only that, but you have a mana sink here. So later in the game, when you have extra mana held up, not only are you not casting a spell, because you're going to use that mana on the ability, so it's going to get a plus one plus one counter like that, but the ability is going to trigger for five mana, and you're going to get an extra plus one plus one counter on it as well. Not to mention, if there are any other creatures uh, on the field that are getting plus one plus one counters, they're going to get extra plus one plus one counters when you use that ability. So if there's any kind of a plus one plus one counter archetype in limited in this set, this card can absolutely slot into that, but it's going to be especially good with plot and with flash things. So, very high pick if you're in those archetypes. Definitely want to jam it. Lifelink guy that can grow. It's going to be good. Next up, we have Prosperity Tycoon. One white and three for a 4-2 human noble. When it enters, you create a 1-1 red mercenary token that can tap to give something plus one plus zero oh at sorcery speed. You can also pay two and sacrifice any token to give Prosperity Tycoon indestructible until end of turn, and then you have to tap it. Now, it's important to note that tapping it is not part of the cost. So if it's already tapped, it's fine. You, you can do this, and it's already tapped, and it just taps something that's already tapped, and nothing happens, and you're fine. Um, the reason it's going to tap it is to make sure that you don't get to keep this guy alive on your turn and still hold him up as a blocker on your opponent's turn, right? If you could give him Indestructible without him becoming tapped and be able to hold him up as a blocker after that, you could just make him survive your opponent's removal spell and then still make him block your opponent's creature and become Indestructible again. It would get kind of wild. So that's why they have that tap clause in there. But the fact that you could sack any token to give it Indestructible and it comes with a token to just kind of like buy you some time until you get some more tokens into play, I think this card is just insane and limited, man. You can swing in with it every single turn, and like, your opponent doesn't really want to block it because they know you're just going to give it indestructible if they do. But at the same time, if they don't block it, you just get in for four and don't have to sacrifice anything. And then you can do it again the next turn. So it puts your opponents back against the wall and puts them in a very difficult position where it's going to be really hard for them to deal with this card appropriately as long as you have... 
a reasonable way of making tokens. But even that one token that it just comes with is going to be good. Heck, that token itself can tap to make this thing do 5 damage instead of 4 before it ever even becomes sacked to this thing. So, just a lot of value to be had here. I think this is actually a very high pick in white, and I recommend trying to grab it quick. Don't let it table. Next up, we have Requisition Raid. This is one white for a sorcery with Spree. For an extra mana, it destroys an artifact. For an extra mana, it destroys an enchantment. For an extra mana, you put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature that target player controls. This is kind of bananas. A uh, couple things I want to note here. This can just destroy everything <laughs> if you just pay all the mana, right? It could just do everything, which is awesome. But it's the same cost as a normal disenchant for the normal ability of a disenchant, except it could also be this plus one, plus one counter mode if you need it instead or in addition. Or you can destroy both the artifact and enchantment. There's just so much upside on this card, it's insane. And this is an easy way of getting artifact and enchantment into your main deck, uh, artifact and enchantment hate into your main deck without it feeling like a wasted slot because at the very least, you can buff up your whole team with counters. And also, keep in mind the fact that if you really, really, really need to commit a crime, you could target the other player with the third mode when they don't have any creatures out, and nothing's going to get counters, but you're still able to target the opponent, and it will start as uh, it will count as committing a crime. Or maybe they just have one creature out, and it's going to get the plus one plus one counter, but you know it's going to die to something else later anyway, so you're not worried about it. If you just need to commit that crime, that's another way you could use this. I don't expect it to come up very often, but it is something you should keep in the back of your mind, because the potential is there, and it would be a really cool play for sure. Next up, we have Rest in Peace. Yes, another reprint, another control staple. One white and one for an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, exile all graveyards. That's bad enough for just two mana. That shuts down all graveyard synergies, right? But also, it stays on the battlefield as an enchantment, and if a card or token will be put into a graveyard from anywhere, you exile it instead. Nothing ever goes to your graveyard ever again. This is problematic. This shuts down any reanimator deck, any deck that's trying to self-mill or re rely on graveyard synergies at all. Like, it, all your stuff getting exiled to begin with is bad enough, but like, you, it, you just literally can never put anything into your graveyard ever again, and that's just insane. So it just completely, like, you just automatically win, pretty much, if you play it against a deck that's really reliant on the graveyard. But the most important deck that this shuts down, at least in Standard, is the new Insidious Roots decks that have been popping up since the last set. Those decks are looking to get even stronger with some support cards that came in this set, but this card right here shuts it down completely. If you don't have any creatures to exile from your graveyard ever again for the rest of the game, your Insidious Roots becomes a dead card and can do nothing. So. This card can be insane, it's going to be a really good sideboard choice, and it almost makes me wonder if Insidious Roots decks are going to very quickly go the way of the Dodo because uh, this card exists in Standard now. It's kind of scary. Next up we have Rustler Rampage. This is one white mana for an instant with Spree. You can pay an extra mana to untap all creatures target player controls. You can pay an extra mana to give target creature double strike until end of turn. This is just a really cool combat trick. You can swing with everything, and then on their turn, when they try to crack back, you just untap everything, block a bunch of their stuff, and blow them out. That's pretty wild. But being able to give double strike as well means maybe that thing of yours that was gonna die isn't, or maybe it is gonna die, but it deals double damage now and kills the thing that it otherwise wouldn't. And because of that mode, there's a little bit of upside here in that you could use it on your turn. So maybe you're not saving it, to blow them out as a surprise after they attack, but you can still give something double strike when you're attacking to get in for extra damage, and just pay the extra mana if you want to still untap all of your creatures. Even though it's not a surprise, they're still untapped to block on your opponent's next turn, so a lot of cool ways to use this card. I think it's a relatively high pick as long as you're really deep into going wide with creatures, um, and it's hard to know that super early in the draft. So you might not want to grab this right away, but by the time you get to pack two and you know that you're going that direction with your deck, this probably ends up being a decently high pick at that point. Next up, we've got Shepherd of the Clouds. And yes, this is actually my pick for the best card in Limited for white. 
This is one white and four for a four three Pegasus with flying and vigilance. Full stop there. That alone, super good in limited, right? A four three flying vigilance, it's gonna swing in with flying for four damage every turn and still hang back to block any flyers that have two power or less and just eat them. In worst case scenario, you trade with their bigger four toughness flyer, but got to swing in first and get some damage before you did it. All of that is awesome. And it's only one white mana, so you get to splash this in whatever deck you need to. If it's just your splash color, it's awesome. But then, as if that wasn't enough, what really puts this card over the top and makes it my best pick for limited, because it's already a solid limited card, but not like a best pick, but what makes it a best pick is when it enters the battlefield, you return any permanent with mana value three or less from your graveyard to your hand. But if it was a mount, or sorry, if you control a mount, you get to return that card to the battlefield instead. Honestly, just bringing it back to your hand is kind of crazy enough. Like that's just sheer value on top of a card that's already plenty good enough to be running. Um, any three drop, whatever, whatever you played on turn three and your opponent traded with it or they killed it with a removal spell, you just get it back. You just keep putting pressure on your opponent and that's just insane value. But on the off chance that you also have a mount and it just goes straight into play, you get this huge tempo advantage of not having to pay for it next turn, being able to spend your mana on even more stuff and getting even further ahead. It's just a lot. It's a lot packed into one card. Granted, five mana is five mana, but this card is absolutely worth it. Do not pass it. It will not table. Grab the card. Play the card. Next up, we have Sheriff of Safe Passage. This is one white and two for a 0-0 zero, zero human knight. It enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it, plus an additional plus one plus one counter on it for each other creature you control. So it's another one of those counters matters cards uh, that's going to work really well with that prairie dog card we saw before because the activated ability can put more counters on this potentially. Um, but this also plots for one white and one. So not only do you get to play it for a little bit less mana, but you can put it into exile and wait to play it on a turn where you have way more creatures so that you can get way more value out of it, right? If you're just playing a deck that's kind of trying to hold back and wait for your bombs to come and you're not in a rush to just burn down your opponent's life total, this can just hang out in exile. And as long as your opponent's not being overly aggressive and you don't feel like you need to commit more to the board to like even it out, you can just let it sit there and you just grow your board by casting more and more things. And if you get into a pickle where your opponent's you know, got control of the board and they're winning the board state. Maybe you play this out and now you have this giant guy that they don't want to swing into. It just seems good. Having the option of doing either or just seems really good. It's a human knight. It does not count as an outlaw. That is a very important thing to note. Do not try to run this in outlaw tribal. You will be very disappointed. Next up, we have stagecoach security. One white and four for a four five human soldier. When it enters the battlefield, creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and vigilance until end of turn, and it plots for one white and three. I think the ability to plot this and get that sort of alpha strike buff off of it for zero mana on a later turn is way better than it looks like on paper. I just, those kinds of abilities where you don't want them right away, you want them on just the right turn, seem perfect for a card that's plotted, because you can just let it sit there in exile as long as you want until it's needed and then it just comes down for free so you're playing all your other stuff you normally would that turn but you're also buffing up your whole team giving them vigilance and getting a four or five body that can be a lot this is a really good common again i just feel like ever since they changed to play boosters from the normal draft boosters i feel like the quality of the commons has gone way up there's there's never really any dead cards anymore they're all playable so this is a fine card. You can easily grab it in the second half of a pack uh, and jam one into your white deck to fill it out. Next up, we have Steer Clear. One white for an instant. It deals two damage to any attacking or blocking creature. It deals four damage to that creature instead if you control the mount as you cast this spell. So obviously, if you're going deep into mounts, this is going to be very, very good removal that you're going to want to pick high. It's better than Lightning Bolt, right? Well. It has to, it still has to hit an attacking or blocking creature, right? Um, so it's not better than Lightning Bolt, but four damage for one mana, you're not going to find much better than that. Uh, <laughs> 
even if you're not super deep into mounts, right? If you just have a couple of mounts in your deck, it's still going to be really good because you've got basically a shock that has to be used in combat, but still a shock that could be way better than a shock if you happen to get one of your mounts. So it's just sheer upside. Uh, I think this is an easy pick later on in the pack if you're, you know, low on, on removal and you need to fill up that slot. Next up, we have Sterling Keykeeper. One white and one for a 2-2 human mercenary. It can pay two and tap it to tap target non-mount creature. Cool little ability here. Um, I'm, I'm used to these abilities kind of costing like three mana, so the fact that it's only two is kind of nice, although it can't target mounts. Um, that's kind of a bummer, but this does count as an outlaw. I think this is decent if you're in a deck that's just trying to drag out the game and get to a point where you can like maybe cast a big flyer and win with that. Um, I don't think it's a high pick at all, um, but you could do a lot worse than to grab one of these later on in the pack and jam it into your deck. Next up we have Sterling Supplier. One white and four for a 3-4 bird soldier with flying. I am starting to lose my voice, so I think we need to hurry up and finish this, huh? <laughs> when it enters the battlefield, you put a plus one plus one counter on another target creature you control. Not bad. It's not as good as that other flyer we saw. Not, not by a long shot. But 3-4 flyer is pretty decent. It's going to stabilize your board pretty well, and it's going to make something else bigger, and it could just make them just big enough to actually be super relevant and help stall your opponent's board state or help get in for the damage you need to get in make it hard for them to block so a lot of versatility here it's also going to be good in like the plus one plus one counters matters type of archetype if that archetype is a thing in this set i think it is i think it is we've seen a few support cards right um so nice nice plethora of ways you could utilize this card it's just one of those cards that you're you're going to include as your 22nd 23rd card um if you're a little little bit low on board presence here we have Take Up the Shield, one white and one for an instant, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature, it gains lifelink and indestructible until end of turn. So a nice little bit of instant speed like, gotcha, you didn't kill my guy, you know, counter their removal, but in addition to that you also gain some life from getting lifelink until end of turn and you get a plus one plus one counter that's going to stick on the creature forever so you get some long term value, you pad out your life and you save your guy. That's kind of a lot, honestly on one two mana instant speed spells so i think this card is actually really good you're probably not going to play more than one of them um but it could also work out as a nice a nice card in like the double spell archetype depending um because it is a relatively cheap instant so a lot of potential here I'm not 100 percent sure if you want to grab it high i guess it depends on how problematic the removal ends up being in this set in this set and just how prevalent it seems like there's going to be a lot so that might make the value of this card go up a little bit and limited next up we have thunder lasso one white and two for an artifact equipment when it enters the battlefield you attach it to any creature you control that creature gets plus one plus one uh, it equips for two so if that creature dies you can re-equip it for two mana to a different creature whenever equipped creature attacks you tap target creature defending player controls this is a little bit expensive Three mana to buff your dude, plus one, plus one, and get this attack trigger to, to tap down their best blocker is a bit much. Um, you're only ever going to be able to use it on attacks, right? It doesn't help you on defense. Uh, you're only ever going to be able to stop one creature from blocking, so if they have two really good blockers, you still probably can't swing in with this. That being said... It is a nice little bit of buff that you can just move on to a new creature when something dies. So if you need to swing in, tap down their big creature, and even if they block and trade with the thing that has the Thunder Lasso, you could just keep equipping it to something else and keep doing the thing. Uh, if they have just one flyer, you know, you can equip this and swing in and make sure their flyers tap down so that whatever flyers you have are getting through for damage. So there's some cool ways you can use it, but I do think it's a bit expensive, so... I'm not 100% sure I would pick it very high. This is one of those cards I'm actually going to have to test playing before I truly know just how good it is. It's going to be very dependent on how the rest of, of the cards in the format really play out. Next up we have Trained Arynx. I actually kind of love this card. It was also almost a pick for best limited. One white and one for a 3-1 cat beast mount. You can saddle it for two. 
And whenever it attacks while saddled, it gains first strike until end of turn, and you scry one. And that's the key there, you also scry one. Being able to swing with a three power first striker that you played on turn two is already really good. And remember, part of what makes this so good is the fact that then on turn three, you can play a creature and use that creature to saddle it immediately. Your creature doesn't have to not have summoning sickness in order to saddle something, right? So you can play a creature that otherwise can't attack, still use it to saddle the r which is really, really nice. Um, swing in with first strike. It's going to be really hard for them to block without just getting blown out, right? And then every time you do that, you're scrying one. If you can just swing in with this saddled every single turn and never have to hold it back and not swing, you're scrying one every turn for the rest of the game, which is digging you one card deeper to your bombs. It's getting you the best of the top two cards set up for your turn cycle, for your for your draw on your turn, every single turn cycle. So it's like, if every turn you're drawing the best of the top two cards instead of just randomly whatever's on top, like, you're gonna have way more value than you otherwise would have. So I really think the potential for this to snowball and just attack saddled every single turn and always get you that value and eventually get you to a point where you just have way more value than your opponent is pretty crazy on a creature that can swing in protected by its own first strike that's activated as well. So I think this card's actually really good. I plan on picking it relatively high, at least for a common. Next up, we have Vengeful Townsfolk. One white and two for a 3-3 human citizen. Whenever one or more other creatures you control die, you put a plus one, plus one counter on Vengeful town, Townsfolk. Towns, townsfolk? Townsfolk. Okay. So 3-3 three, three for three. That's going to get bigger every time something dies. Seems really good. What else can I say? <laughs> it's going to be good in the plus one, plus one counter theme deck. It's going to be good with uh, Prairie Dog and stuff like that. It's just going to be good in anything that's going wide, whether it be mercenary tokens or just a bunch of little creatures. Um, this is just going to be good support if you're in those types of arch archetypes. You're probably going to want to pick one up. And the last card is Wanted Griffin. A 3-2 flying griffin for 1 white and 3. When it dies, you get to make a 1-1 mercenary token that can tap to give something plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn at sorcery speed. This is a nice little, little flyer. It's nice to come down for 4 mana as a 3 power flyer. Um, it stinks that you don't get the mercenary right away so that you can buff your flyer with it. Uh, but it's nice that when it dies you do get some value, right? If, you, if you're in a deck that has a decent amount of flyers so that when this one dies you still have another flyer left over that the mercenary you're getting can pump up, that's going to be especially good. So keep that in mind. I think this is just a nice little bit of filler. If you're in a deck that's trying to hold off until you get an evasive creature and use it to win the game, uh, and you just need a few more evasive creatures, uh, you're probably going to jam this in your deck. But you could probably pick it up, you know, middle of the pack, towards, towards the last half of the pack. It shouldn't be too hard to get a copy of this. And that's it for white. We finally finished it. I've almost lost my voice, so thank god we're almost done. Uh, so much more is on the way. We've got the colorless set review and the multicolor set review. If you haven't seen the set review for each of the other four colors, I've already done those and I'm going to link those in the description. So make sure and check those out. If you haven't yet, like the video because it helps me out so damn much. Subscribe if you're new if you find any value in this video because I got so much more on the way. So many crazy decks coming. Pretty much one every single day as soon as the set's released. So many cool ideas. I'm just I'm just ready to, to vomit them all out for you and, and uh, see if they, they meet your harsh criticism. We'll see. But uh, with all that said, look forward to the other videos. Look forward to the deck techs. So much is coming. I love you to pieces. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much for checking out my channel. I'd like to give a huge shout out to all of my patrons over at Patreon. Without you guys, this channel would not be possible. So honestly, thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of your contributions. If you haven't yet, like and subscribe. The more likes we get and the quicker we get them, the bigger this channel will grow and the faster it will grow. I'd love nothing more than this channel to become something very special for you guys, but it's entirely up to you how fast that happens. Also, if you'd like more deck text, that's somewhere over there, 
And if you'd like to see what else the channel's been up to lately, that's somewhere up that way. Also, subscribe, circle below, do all the things.